Welcome to the Wealth Stream Podcast. The team at Hightower Great Lakes share their insights and passions for empowering their clients to live their best life. In this energetic podcast, we will take you on a journey to help you navigate your financial future, overcome life's challenges to reach your financial goals, and find the financial clarity you've been searching for. Let's explore the downstream impact of your wealth and what it means to you, your family, and your community to live greater. Hello and welcome to The Wealth Stream with Tim Scannell from Hightower Great Lakes. I am super excited, Tim, because I know that you have Justin McCurdy in studio with you. What are you guys yes. doing? Justin is here for a second time. I, I, He was willing and able to be my next victim. Yes. So we're looking forward to it. <laughs> yes. Uh, randomly on my calendar appeared this podcast recording. So here we are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. It is Justin part two. That's right. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So Justin, part two, what is this podcast about then? So in the first in episode 63, I interviewed, you know, Justin was on it and it was really more of a way to introduce the listeners to Justin as a key part of our team. But the reason why I thought I'd have him on again today is, you know, I'm asked more and more by clients, by, you know, peers to work with their children, their children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Also, we do a lot, a number of, we have a number of clients who are business owners. They're asking me to work with their key employees. And what I'm finding is that they're obviously a different stage of life than me, right? I'm on the back end, maybe. So I'm 58 and in working with them, I went through the same stage of life they're going through, but mm -hmm. I'm also finding as I meet with them that their stage of life is just a little different than mine, you know? So <laughs> I was telling my kids explaining that I used to have a bag phone. I don't know. Eric, if you ever had what your first phone looked like from, and they didn't even know what I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know what a bag phone is. I didn't have one of those because quite honestly, those were way too expensive for me uh, to, oh. to own a bag phone, but we had one of the first ones. And, and I remember it came with the game snake, which was, you know, all the rage. Exactly. And then I went, I upgraded to a brick phone and then yes. a flip phone and. And of course I had pagers and my kids were like, what's a pager? You know, so they, I just told them to watch some eighties movies and they could see what pagers are. That's right. And, and actually I was tooling through, you probably don't even know this exists, but a Hewlett Packard has a computer museum online. And I took a look at it to find my first laptop at least when I worked as an auditor, they called it a luggable and I didn't pay for it cause I was working for an accounting firm, but for $5,000, you could get a, a 28 pound laptop, which is basically what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being heavy. I didn't know it was realize it was 28 pounds though, but thank God for the museum. Yeah. It, it came with a small monkey to carry it around or a cart, depending on <laughs> exactly what it should have. Grief. So anyway, I just wanted to bring Justin in because um, he's been super helpful. I mean, he's going through the CFP program uh, and helping me, you know, doing planning for the, what I call the next generation. So yeah. I just thought the listeners would like to hear from him and talk about some of the things that we do that specifically affect his peer group as they're accumulating wealth. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and Justin, I'm sure that you're working with all sorts of technologies that you, you don't have to lug around like this, or you don't have to load a program from a cassette tape, which we can talk about later. <laughs> Not at all. It's uh, all web-based and a laptop weighs maybe three pounds, if that. Yeah. Uh, so Eric, he's not going to borrow your 8-track player either. Seriously. So. Yeah. That, I, yeah, I'd hesitate to see what somebody would do with an 8-track these days. Exactly. All right. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear what Justin's doing. Justin, thank you so much for being here. Uh, teach the old guys, would you? Yeah. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I thought initially, Justin, maybe you could just talk briefly about where you're at with your CFP program, the Certified Financial Planning designation. Yes. So it's an intensive program, education component, and it's five classes spread out over a few months each. And right now I'm in the middle of tax class. So learning all the ins and outs and details about income and then the taxation of income. So I think, you know, maybe next year I can file my own tax return. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can, it, it looks to me like, or they're saying that the tax laws might change dramatically too. So it's probably good timing to at least get a feel for how it works and then we can respond to how the clients should make changes too. Yes. I like to say that the government is helping keep us in business in some sense because they keep changing the rules and regulations. And sometimes I wonder, you know, as an outsider to the industry, how would you even begin to make sense of all of the details and fine regulations that there are related to taxes and how would you even navigate those? Yeah. No, I know with this tax season, I've had a number of people ask me how they report buys and sells of, you know, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. And 
I think a lot of people that I talked to didn't think they had to report it. I'm like, no, you got to report it. The yes. IRS wants their share, right? <laughs> the IRS always, well, the IRS, meaning the government, always wants their share and their portion of income. So what I thought I'd do is kind of walk through our wealth management process and the different areas we focus in and just have you talk a little bit about, based on you know your peer group, you know, out of college several years, accumulating your, you know, starting your career or advancing your career, accumulating some wealth, and just kind of go through and talk about the unique things that you do with clients that maybe I'm not doing as much because maybe my clients are more on the, the accumulated and they're exiting. So like investment management, for example, when you work with clients in your peer group, and, you know, as they're maybe two, three, five, 10 years out of, out of school and they're growing their career, how do you talk about risk? You know, how do you, how do you analyze that or, or work with them about like the risk they should be taking? Yeah. So it's a multifold approach. The first is we have a risk tolerance survey, Riskalyze that we use. That's a way to kind of look at risk on an objective basis and compare someone's individual risk number on a scale of one to 100 to a portfolio to objectively compare the two together as one factor of it. The other factor we really look at is the time frame. So those who are on the younger end of their career really have a long time frame till the expected need for their retirement fund. So that's a big factor and a big part of the discussion where we're helping and in some cases advising people to be a little bit more aggressive than they feel comfortable with because they do have the time frame to recover from COVID market corrections or other market corrections. And each one of those corrections is going to be different. The COVID correction, we saw recovery within a year. You know, but back in 2008, 2009, that took more like three, four, five years to get the recovery. So really just planning for and expecting that those corrections and those types of swings are going to take place, but that they have the time frame to withstand and to weather the storm there. Okay. And then also as you get into risk management investment processes, you know, I had a meeting this morning where the client asked me about the articles that she had read about GameStop or trading just in general, not specifically about that company. What do you think about, like, do you get questions from your peers, your clients about diversification versus concentration and how that impacts risk? Yes, definitely. We definitely have the conversation about concentration is a higher risk, but there is the higher potential for return, but you also have a higher potential for loss. If you invest in one company that may triple within a few years, or it may, in some cases, go bankrupt and be worth nothing. So there's definitely a higher risk there compared to diversifying and really spreading your portfolio across a variety of investments that you're going to have winners and losers in and really are targeting to have more winners than losers and to really have growth from there, but also safety from the downside that if I own a hundred different stocks, if one or two go bankrupt or don't do well, that's not going to significantly, you know, wipe out any investing or any, you know, funds that I've saved. And I know we spend a lot of time and energy and we have a lot of resources. We contract with a number of CFAs, Charter Financial Analysts, and groups of them to help us with that process. And that gets, gets into another question that I don't know if you get asked periodically about do it yourself or, you know, why do I need an advisor? I mean, when someone asks you that, why do I need you versus doing it myself? You know, what, how do you typically respond to that? Yeah, so I think one value that having an advisor adds is definitely behavioral coaching and the behavioral side of investing and being able to talk through the feelings and emotions related to seeing large swings and, vol and volatility in the markets and helping to just understand and normalize that in a sense and be able to be okay with that and to talk through that with someone versus investing just on your own and your stock goes down 20% in one day you might just sell it versus having a conversation first before then deciding what to do with it. So I think that's definitely one aspect of it. And the other aspect and how I think about it personally is I have a small chunk of investments that I manage myself and I pick that I want to, you know, control that little portion of it. And the rest of it is invested with our team and leverages our investment strategy team of chartered financial analysts and other experts who are going out there and helping to source the mutual funds, ETFs, and stocks that are going to they think are going to perform well. And so I like partnering with them and taking some of the 
individual stock picking responsibility off of myself to leverage that team. And that's what people who come and work with us can do is help leverage our team and our extended investment strategy team to pick those investments and to choose those funds to diversify instead of just picking a few individual stocks to invest in. Yeah. And I agree with you. And I know when I talk to your peers, people, you know, the next generation of investors, we talk a lot about building a team of advisors, you know, and I've, and I think the wealth manager, the investment professional is, is just a great part of the long-term team. The other thing we do beyond investment management is we, we get into advanced planning with all of our clients. So for example, wealth transfer, and I'm guessing that as you talk to your, your clients, uh, you know, your peers, they're probably not thinking immediately of, you know, do I need a will or an estate, but you know, how do you discuss estate planning with somebody maybe who is five, six, 10 years out of school, maybe in building their career where they're not necessarily focusing so much. Uh, they think they'll live forever, right? Yeah, definitely. It's about taking care of the basics of making sure that you're listing the correct people you want to list as beneficiaries on your workplace retirement accounts or your insurance policies through work, as well as any accounts you have outside of that. If you have a bank account, making sure that you're listing somebody there directly so you can avoid trouble for your heirs and eventually claiming any assets if something does happen. And I find frequently that on the younger generation, we're going through a lot of life changes kind of rapidly, very quickly, you know, getting married, having kids, et cetera. And kind of each of those is a good checkpoint to say, hey, let me check my beneficiaries and make sure. Because if you get married, you may forget that you listed your sibling or your parents to receive your assets if something happens to you, but you really want to be listing your spouse in most cases. So it's it's a little bit simplistic, but it is making sure that the bases are covered and you know also having basic estate plan documents done powers of attorney living health declarations and a simple will just to have that in place so that if something happens there's not nothing done to prepare and plan for it yeah i think i find a lot of people don't realize until they put together a balance sheet and they look at what they have that they actually have more than they think and if something did happen to them you know, you just want to make sure you know where it's going. Otherwise, you know, the state you live in has has laws that determines where it goes and it may not be where you want it and it, it'll be expensive, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, each state's different and generally you would think maybe the state thinks the same way you do, but that's probably not the case. So yeah. always better to be safe and to list a direct beneficiary. It just makes everything easier for your heirs if something happens. And then in addition to wealth transfer, strategies and techniques. We also focus on wealth protection, you know, things like insurance, property and casualty, life disability. So when you're working, I know, for example, you know, you, when you got out of school, you started working and then you got married, you know, considering having kids, you know, what goes through your mind, but also what do you think about talking to your clients about in terms of wealth protection, protecting the plans that they, that you've put together with your partner? Yeah, definitely. Life is kind of, life insurance is kind of the initial insurance everybody jumps to of protecting risk and protecting the downside to their spouse or to their kids if they were to pass prematurely. So when we talk through that, you know, some of the items that go into thinking about and calculating, you know, what value or what dollar amount of life insurance do I need? It's thinking about what liabilities do I want to be paid off if I pass away and leave my spouse, you know, what other goals I may want to fund. So if I have kids, I may want to pre-fund their education if I pass away prematurely. And then also, you know, thinking about replacing some income for my spouse, you know, during the years that I would have been working that I am not if I pass away. And then you're right, there is other insurance we can get into after that, such as, you know, in certain fields, disability insurance is really important if someone's in a highly skilled position, such as a surgeon or the medical field is a, a common place for disability policies to make sure that they're covered if something happens and they can't continue that line of work. And then health insurance is, you know, pretty much basic through your employer, but sometimes it's definitely helpful to talk through that with an advisor and understand the differences between a high deductible plan versus another plan and to do some comparisons of one spouse's plan versus another. I think one thing especially that people often skip over in the analysis of choosing insurance is 
you have to look beyond just the deductible and the out-of-pocket maximum. You have to look at the total cost, which also includes the payroll, de uh, payroll deductions that are occurring each pay period because that impacts part of the cost as well when you're evaluating which insurance option makes the most sense. Yeah, I know one of the things that we do for a lot of clients is we have a offer a second opinion or we do what we call a stress test or an audit. And I know, you know, we're not in the property and casualty business, but I know oftentimes we do these audits, we help them and we kind of collaborate with their other professionals and find that there's even gaps on the property, you know, like, like an umbrella liability, things mm -hmm. like that. I, so, you know, th there's just, I'm a strong advocate for periodically auditing, you know, or just checking to see, you know, I'm sure you're doing that with your clients. Yes, it definitely makes sense to review those things regularly to make sure that nothing needs increased, changed, and that nothing's falling through the cracks. And then beyond wealth protection, we focus also, we help clients leverage their charitable intent. You know, for, I find that, you know, at least a third or half of our clients or more sometimes, but have some sort of favored charity, charitable intent. I know you do personally, Justin. So, you know, with your peer group as working with next gen, and I know you're involved in your church, what kind of charitable tax planning or other planning do you talk about when you're working with clients? Yeah, unfortunately right now you really have to donate a lot to get a direct <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> direct tax benefit. So in some cases, if people are, you know, making larger sum donations or a few years would add up to a larger sum donation, it may make sense to donate a large amount in year one and have that kind of cover for five years in a sense versus splitting that donation, let's say $50,000 over five years to 10,000 a year, you might get a better tax benefit by doing 50,000 in one year and then nothing for years two through five. Mm -hmm. So that's one big strategy. That's kind of the main one I would think with charitable planning at a young age. If you start talking about bigger gifts and such, there's other strategies and techniques that come into play down the road after assets have been accumulated, such as gifting stock or setting up a donor advised fund but that's kind of a later stage of life usually. Yeah, I know with, I'm guessing that with some of your peers you went to maybe Notre Dame with who are off into the tech world where they have options and, you know, they have t a lot more complicated tax issues. And, you know, one of the things we talk about is instead of writing a check for your favorite charity, you know, trying to gift appreciated shares or things like that is a, is a really good tax strategy. Definitely. And then beyond that, the fourth area of advanced planning that we talk about with clients is really what we call wealth enhancement. And that gets to tax planning, which is, you know, what, what you're focusing on now with your CFP, but also, you know, cash flow planning, debt structure. You know, I'm sure a lot of your peers still have student loans and how do you, with different multiple rates and some are refinanceable, some are not, and I want to buy a house or things. So talk about some of the things that you might focus on with your clients with, with in the wealth enhancement sphere. Yeah, I mean, I like to think about it from a perspective of it all starts with sort of a budget in a sense, not a budget that we're going to tell you you can only spend $200 a week on groceries, but really a budget in the sense of understanding how much money is coming in every month and then where am I spending that to come up with basically free cash flow or what's left. So say, you know, I have $5,000 coming in a month, I spend 4000 well, that gives me 1000 a month that then I can take and evaluate where I need to prioritize, whether that's saving for a down payment, attacking debt more aggressively and making extra payments on debt, or increasing a 401k contribution, or you know saving into a 529 for college savings for a child. So really I look at it as first you gotta understand what the excess amount is and then you can help allocate out to where that money is best moved at that point. Okay. And then, you know, when you look at all of that, the investment management, the advanced planning, the different things, you know, I also find that people don't realize how complicated their lives are until they really dive into it. And in fact, sometimes that's why they don't dive into it, right? Because there's hesitation to really jump into the detail. But, you know, how do you recommend, how do you or how do you recommend your clients maybe organize and keep their records safe? Things like that. Like, because you obviously have insurance policies and mortgage information, things like that. Yeah, it's definitely important to have all of that in one place. Nowadays, the storage of that is going more towards digital and a lot of password managers that you can use offer digital storage with it. I know the client portal that we use in our office, we offer our clients 
they have what we call a vault where they can electronically upload copies of all of those important documents. And it helps to just organize as you accumulate these documents versus kind of tossing them all in a pile and then trying to make a big project of sorting through them. I think it's easier if you kind of organize and take the time to put it away, file it away right when you get it and to save those documents securely. Make sure you have a backup with computers, you know, can upload it to the cloud as well to make sure that you have something, you know, in case your computer dies and your hard drive fails, that you've got a backup somewhere else and aren't relying on just one copy of it. Yeah. And I know when we work with clients, we work with their other advisors. We're certainly not, we don't claim to know everything, right? So we do not. <laughs> and, and this is the, this is the season because we're in tax season where we're doing a lot of collaboration with clients on their, their, their CPAs, their accountants. And I know we're helping them store and deliver a lot of safely and encrypted a lot of information to and from them. What, you know, as you're talking with your peer group, as you're talking with people who are, that you're working with clients, what other professionals uh, are critical for them to like build a team and in, in that, that you collaborate with? Yeah, I think CPAs is definitely a good starting point and kind of as you progress through your career, your tax situation may become more and more complex where, you know, in college, you may have been able to get away with filing your own on TurboTax, but as you get into things like stock options or other more complex structures, it definitely is important to get a CPA that's in your corner who's going to help you navigate that and also is going to provide advice and strategies on how to minimize taxes and or defer taxes. Yeah, and I know attorneys, so when you're, I imagine a lot of your peers are at the point now where maybe they're working for a firm that has options or maybe they're in being, being given opportunity to be a partner or to join a firm or so there's just, you know, pretty complicated contractual arrangements, restrictive covenants, all that stuff. So I, I know, you know, have you, have you been, do you work with their attorneys also? Attorneys? Yes. You know, a lot of times that's more just on the estate planning side, but as they have those more complex scenarios come up, it helps to have built a little bit of a relationship with an attorney through the just basic estate planning to be able to then work with that attorney or someone that they work closely with in their office to evaluate contracts and to read all the legal details of different happenings that may be going on. And then just one other area. So I'm, I'm wondering if when you're working with clients, are you finding that they're asking you about how they can help their parents and grandparents, things like that? You know, because it seems to be that people are living longer and oftentimes, you know, your generation is maybe now helping de decisions for their parents, their grandparents, et cetera. Do you run across that much? A little bit. Yeah. You know, for example, I was meeting with somebody just the other day and kind of talking about their parents and if they expected to, you know, need to provide much support or anything there. And kind of their consensus was, we don't think we'll have to provide any support, but we want to be able to have the cushion if we need to and want to, to be able to support them at some point later on in life. So it's starting to become a, a thought process for a lot, I think. And, and the opposite side too, it also, do you consider potential inheritances or things like that when you're doing planning? Or do you just say that could happen, but let's not make it part of the plan? Unfortunately, in a lot of families, there's kind of a you know, brick wall between the parents and the kids, <laughs> sure. especially talking numbers wise that you know the kids may know I'm going to inherit something, but they probably don't know the dollar value of that. So that makes it difficult to plan for. And I would say we like to shoot on the conservative side of things always. So we'll go conservative and we'll plan on that being nothing. And then when that does happen, that becomes a bonus and allows them to enhance their quality of life or add a few goals that they can accomplish. So within. if you were speaking to the generations above you or ahead of you, would you be on the side of more transparency about wealth from parents and grandparents or less or what's your, what's your feeling about that because i know i work with a lot of of the parents and grandparents who sometimes feel like well i don't know if i want to share everything where do you where do you fall in that debate yeah so i, I fall kind of in the middle <laughs> okay. i don't have a strong opinion either sure. way necessarily i think a lot of it depends on the circumstances and the kids you know if if the kids have the mentality of you know, I'm not really going to touch mom and dad's money or, you know, anything that I inherit from them, then it's a different story versus if they knew how much they may inherit someday, if that impacts, you know, their motivation and their 
drive to work and to accumulate and their spending at the current age. So I think definitely, you know, the starting path is having those conversations and putting maybe rough dollar amounts to them and just starting to have the conversation about transferring wealth down to the next generation, but then even talking to that generation about how to steward that wealth and pass some of that down further generations. Yeah. Passing some of the legacy and the history mm-hmm. and things like that, I think is critical. So if some, if the list, somebody out there listening wants to work with you or at least get more information, you know, one of the things we offer is this a second opinion service that we've got some really great feedback from clients about. So maybe talk a little bit about what you would do in offering a second opinion to somebody who reached out to you. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I know Tim's talked about the multiple stages of the process on the podcast here before, but the second opinion service really focuses on the first two stages. The first stage being a discovery meeting and diving deep and asking questions back and forth to understand, gather data, to understand goals, plans, objectives in life, to really have the full picture and full view of what life looks like and what you know they want to accomplish. And then we kind of take all that information in, all of you know, the questions we've asked, and then we'll come up with sort of a plan and some recommendations. And then really that's the, the deliverable is a plan and some, you know, telling somebody, Hey, you're on a good path. Here's three suggestions you can do to make this look even better. Hey, you're not on a good path. Here's three things you really should do to get yourself on a good path. I mean, really the goal is to kind of come back to them with some recommendations and some guidance. And then ultimately it's up to them if they want to move forward and enter into some sort of relationship with our team. Excellent. And I, and I know that we're big fans of when people are looking for advisors, talking to, you know, as many as they, they want to. And so do you have any tips for maybe vetting professional advisors? What should somebody look for when they're talking to you or other professional advisors? Yeah, I think you definitely do want to interview and talk to different advisors because you may just click better with somebody versus someone else. And you may find that you really like somebody through this process. So definitely interview a few advisors. You can Google, there's tons of searches. You can search on the CFP website. So I think that's a good point is, you know, we would recommend looking for a certified financial planner or a team that works and has certified financial planners who really have a basis and a foundation in planning versus more so the investment side of things. Another question to definitely ask is, How is the advisor compensated? You want to understand what incentives or lack of incentives there may be for them to recommend or implement certain strategies for you so that you're aware of how they're incentivized and how they may be compensated. And then you maybe even ask them for some references if you want to, you know, have a little bit of better idea of clients that they work with. You can also talk to them about their existing clients and certain scenarios of you know, what's a client situation you've really enjoyed working on? How did you handle it when something went bad? Another question we get to is, so what happens if this doesn't work out? So that's an important question to ask too, to understand what the flexibility is and what your obligation or lack of obligation is with that advisor. And, you know, I'm, I like to tell clients, you know, we hold our accounts at various custodians and any day you decide you're done with us, you call them up and tell them to remove us from the account. And it's as simple as that. So I think that's a overview there Yeah, of we, things to ask. And we definitely hope they don't, but we always want to give, I mean, it's all about the client. We want to give them the flexibility, the control. Uh, they control their own destiny. I always think of, you know, they're the heroes and to best as best we can, we want to be their guides. Well, this is great because I really just wanted to make sure that, you know, from your perspective, using you know our processes and our wealth management system, what are some of the unique things that maybe your peer group would be thinking about? So I'm glad you're able to join us today. Thank you. Certainly, yes. And I know, you know from what I'm reading, it definitely seems like the younger generation focuses a lot on the short term. So that's kind of where we want to meet you at is focusing on some shorter term goals, but also still making sure that the long term is in check and looks good as well. So if you're looking to get in touch with us, feel free to Give me a call or email me. My phone number is 219-476-3035. And my email is jmccurdy at hightoweradvisors.com. Yeah, and one of the things they can get when they reach out is maybe 
I know we have a good a couple of good pieces on our second opinion service tips for vetting professionals, and I think there's a really neat one we have. It's called "What Keeps You Up at Night." So, I th- you know, when we when we provide that to the clients or people who are reaching out to us, I think they find that valuable. So, please reach out to Justin, and he'll be glad to follow up and get you any of this information. Certainly, guys, I, I love the fact that this ended on transparency. Tim, obviously, you've mentored Justin very, very well through these years. Justin, I love the fact that you're right out of the gate. You're like, look, it, I want you to talk to other people as well. I want you to feel comfortable with the process. I want you to, you know, it's it's about you, not about us. And and so obviously, and that's exactly what the team at High Tower Great Lakes does. They, they exemplify that. They they want they put the client first each and every time. So again, Justin, this is fantastic. Tim, thank you so much for bringing Justin on for Justin Part 2. I learned a lot. I heard your passion, Justin. Thank you for being here. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Wellstream Podcast with Tim Scannell. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Tim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hightower Great Lakes, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Stream Podcast. We hope you gained some valuable insight that you can apply to your life and share with others. Please don't forget to subscribe below to be notified when new episodes become available. And don't forget to live greater. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Great Lakes. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Great Lakes is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors LLC. 